grateful, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for a new day, Lord, a new week, a new month, as we are gathered together, Lord, for you in your name. Lord, we need you, Lord, uh, as we look around and see everything that's taking place and everything, everything, everywhere. It's nonstop. It's almost as if something is happening every single day. And, and Lord, we, we need you. These, every time I, I turn on the news, every time I open social media pages and I see the craziness that's taking place, not only in the world around us, but especially in our country, I'm just reminded, Lord, I, I can't wait to go home. I really mean that. I just, I can't wait. I'm, I'm grateful for every blessing I have. I truly am. Uh, but if you were to come back today, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy. I'm more than happy to go, Lord. And, and I just pray, Lord, you would help us to have the right hearts, the right attitudes, to make sure that we are ready to go and to make sure our loved ones are ready to go. And so be glorified. Speak to us. Challenge us. Remind us that this world is temporary, but life is eternal. And we need to know the difference. And so help us, Lord God, help our focus to be where it needs to be. Remind us that this is your word, Lord, and we need, we need all of it, Lord. And so be with us now. Bless our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Well, we took a break last week from Luke. I was not here, and so I'm back this morning. Let's turn back to Luke chapter 12. Book of Luke chapter 12, again, give you guys a few seconds to turn there. As I say all the time, I really encourage everyone to bring a Bible. Bring a Bible. You want to be able to, you know, a lot of people are nowadays, you know, they they use their phones, and you can do that, no doubt about it, but you want to be able to mark stuff up. As God marks your heart, mark your Bible, okay? Mark your Bible, seriously. Make little notes, you know, uh, so that you can be, remember what you've learned and what God spoke to you about. And, and also, again, along with that, so that you can see that what we cover week after week is God's word, okay? It's not my opinion. My opinion doesn't matter. What matters is what God says, and that's why we, again, go line by line and verse by verse in the Word of God. Now, as you turn there again to Luke chapter 12, I'll kind of begin thinking about the the day and age that we're living in and recognizing that every generation has its challenges, right? Every generation. You think back again at our parents, you think back at our grandparents. Again, every generation has its challenges, circumstances that we've all faced, that they've all faced, that made life difficult. But I don't think anyone saw what was going to happen in 2020. Right? Seriously. We couldn't have predicted this. No, no one knew this. No one would have recognized just how crazy life would be in this country. I mean, again, I was, you know, as, you know, when the holidays come around, you're with family and, and you know, if, especially if you have, you know, like an iPhone or something, you get those. This is what you did last year. You guys know what I'm talking about. Those pictures come up, right? And just looking at those things and thinking back and, and so often these last couple months, how life was so different last year. We did not expect this again. And as we look around again at this worldwide pandemic that we're facing, lockdowns. That word bothers me. Seriously. That word bothers me. Social distancing. Having to wear masks. And then you have this potential that this could go on all through next year. Have we heard that lately? It's crazy. The other day I was at a store and I seen a Dr. Fauci bobblehead. I wanted to buy it just to throw rocks at it. I kid you not. I I kid you not. Seriously. And I'm not anti-science or anything like that, but I'm not digging these lockdowns, okay? I'm not into the masks and and none of that stuff. When I look at the statistics of the coronavirus and the fact that, you know, (laughs) the the mortality rate, and none of this is in my notes, but the mortality rate is like 0.000 Two? It's crazy. More people are dying from the flu on a yearly basis. And we're all locked down. And I don't know about you, but this stuff is driving me crazy, okay? Everyone being home. You guys with me? Everyone's at home. And I love my family, right? I wouldn't trade my family. But we're getting on each other's nerves. (laughs) Okay? Seriously. We weren't made for this. You guys know that. And to talk about things getting worse and maybe we're going to have to just lock down the whole country like they're doing in Europe right now. 
I, again, I'm, I'm serious. I, I'm, you know, we're going stir crazy. How about 100,000 businesses that have already closed? 100,000 businesses. We know about the unemployment, right? How about our schools being closed? It's sad. All of this, man, we did not see this coming. And I think, if anything, it is stressing us out. I know, again, all of us, whether we realize it or not, we're stressed, okay? And you see it everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, people are, are, are literally on edge. And it's not going away. We have an election Tuesday. And what happens after that? I mean, they're already boarding up stores. You guys hear about this, right? Worried about rioting. Kind of interesting. What's going to happen in our neighborhoods? You have gun sales through the roof because people, again, they want to defund the police. And then how, who's going to protect us? I mean, you have all this stuff taking place, and, and literally, it's, it's, it's overwhelming as we read the social media, and we watch the news, and this country's divided, and, and everyone is on edge. I wonder how many people are having panic attacks. They don't even know what they're having, right? How many people are in depression right now? This is real, guys, again, and this is in the church as well. How many people are suffering from anxiety? I read something, I'll share this with you. 66% of the U.S. population is on medication now. 66%, that's two-thirds. Two of every three Americans is on some type of medication now. The number, this is the latest statistic, 131 million people on some type of substance. It's crazy. But again, all of this is having dramatic effects on everyone, worldwide. And we didn't see this. We did not see this. Not in the land of the free, right? We did not see this. Now again, as I'm giving you some statistics, again, the CDC just published, this is right off the CDC website, their most recent study on mental health. 41.4% of people are experiencing mental health symptoms due to COVID. 41%. 24.7% of people 18 to 24 have started or increased taking substances to cope with their emotions. And the scary thing, again, is I, I'm going through all these statistics. That group of 18 to 24 is being hit harder than any other group, any other category. And it's sad. My heart literally goes out to the young people. You guys know if you are here uh, Saturday morning when we get together for prayer, the young people are, are most often what I pray for specifically. Not only, again, do I have kids in that category, but I recognize how difficult life must be for that age group. One in four people, 18 to 24, have, have seriously considered committing suicide in the last 30 days. That's what we're living in, guys. This is what we're living through. And it's sad. Every age, every category, male and female, is suffering with anxiety and fear. Worried about their health, right? Worried about getting by. Worried about what the future will hold. And it's real. Again, we, we are living in a stressful time. We are living in a time where people are just overly anxious and overly fearful and overly worried. But let me ask you this morning. Are Christians supposed to worry? I want you to think about that. Because I know a lot of us are worried. I know a lot of us are dealing with these things. The Bible tells us we are not to worry because worry... Is a sign to God that you don't trust him. That's what it means. God, I don't think you see what's happening to me. I don't think you know what I'm going through. And it's a sin because it's the sin of unbelief. You don't believe him. You don't believe the promises he has given you in his word. Now check this out. The word worry, it's an Anglo-Saxon word, very interesting, and it actually means to choke or strangle. That's what the word worry means. 
It means to choke or strangle. And it describes that feeling of being choked out, of being strangled by your fears. Which explains why so many people turn to drugs, right? Turn to self-medicating themselves again, just to deal with how they are feeling. But the Bible tells us that we serve the Prince of Peace, don't we? That's who he is. We just covered that in Isaiah, right? Isaiah 9, 6. He is the Prince of Peace who gives to all that come to him the peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what we're promised in God's word. In other words, those that know Jesus, those that have him in their life, should not have to turn to substances. We should not have to self-medicate to manage our fears. We should be able to go to him to find that peace that he alone can give us. We know peace cannot be found in this world. We know that already. But he's not from this world, amen? He's over this world, as the old saying goes, right? He has the whole world in his hand, which, is mean, which means if we are dealing with fear or anxiety or stress or whatever it is, we need to go to God. We need to go to God. Seriously. We need to spend that time in prayer. We need to open up our Bible and read the promises he has given us in his word. This is what he tells us. And then we read this in 1 Peter 5, 7. I love what Peter said. Peter says, casting all your what? Anxieties, right? Of COVID. That's what it means, right? All your anxieties on him, giving it to him. Why? Because he cares for you. He loves you. He knows what you're going through. And he wants you to bring it to him. These worries, these stresses, that anxiousness and stress is we need to immediately go to God. And we need to cast our cares to him. I love that. Cast it to him. Throw it off your back and throw it to him. Why? Because he cares for you and he can bear it. He can deal with it. We can't, but he can. Now very quickly again, let me touch on where we were. We took a break last week, and so just to kind of remind everybody where we have been. In Luke chapter 12, remember Jesus is on the road. He is heading towards Jerusalem. He's with his disciples. We know he has the 12 with him, but he had many other disciples. The word disciple means learner. Many of them are with him. Some have committed to him, have trusted in him as their Lord, but others are still learning. The word disciple means learner. They're not there yet, but they're learning. They're on their way, we would say. Well, every place Jesus is stopping, he's teaching. But everywhere he's teaching, he's being opposed, okay? Remember, the closer he got to Jerusalem, the more the opposition against him became. And so everywhere he is, he's debating The religious leaders are after him. They're trying to get him to do something wrong or say something wrong so that they can get him. But as he's dealing with this, he's teaching. He's teaching his disciples how to deal with this stress, right? This opposition. And he's teaching lesson after lesson. Now, one of the two important lessons that he has just taught, which you need to remember, number one, he talked about hypocrisy. Being a hypocrite. And he told the crowd, don't be a hypocrite like these religious leaders who hide behind their religion. They're hypocrites. They're serving God the way they want to serve God, not the way God desires to be served. Be careful being caught up in the religious traditions of man and not serving God the way God commands in his word. And that's one of the things he taught us. And it's an important lesson that all of us need to examine to make sure we truly are serving God the way he commands in his word and not just the way a man, a different man, right, tells us. But then the second thing we covered last time, and that is that we have to check our hearts from being greedy. Remember that? Being covetousness. Remember, that's, a, that's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not covet. 
Be careful about wanting more than you need. Be careful about being so caught up in the things of this world that you forget about the next one. And that's what he has just talked about. I want to remind you that last time, and you can look back just the last couple verses, Jesus gave the crowd a parable about a rich fool. Remember that? Why was this man a fool? Well, he was a fool because he became so caught up in his wealth, in the things of this world, that he hoarded them to himself. He died suddenly and left it all for someone else to spend, right? Now, Jesus, in verse 20, called this man a fool. A fool. Why was he a fool? Because if he had been wise... He would have used all that God had given him for God's glory. Isn't that right? He could have shared it with others. He could have gave it, again, to advance the kingdom of God so that others could come to know God. But he got so caught up in what he had, again, that he hoarded it to himself and then died like a fool. Jesus said, and I want you to look at the words in verse 21, he should have been rich towards God. He should have, again, invested in God's kingdom. He could have stored up treasures that one day he would enjoy in heaven, right? What's the old saying? I just gave you this last time, right? We can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. And that's what we're commanded to do. Well, now as we pick it up, again, we're going to pick it up here in verse 22. The conversation continues. There were many in that crowd that just heard Jesus tell them not to be greedy, storing things up in this world, but to give to God, to invest in the kingdom of God. But you and I both know that in every congregation, there are people, maybe many this morning, maybe many online, that struggle in their giving to God. And that's the truth. And this is truth. Again, we we understand that. Why do they struggle? Well, they're worried that if they do that, if they give, maybe they won't have enough left over for themselves. What about me, right? I can't give money to the homeless guy on the street. I need that money. And it's that mentality, right? I can't. It'd be nice to. I'd like to. I'd like to give more, but I can't because what about me? If I do, I won't have enough left for myself. Now, I want to remind you that specifically at this time, Jesus' 12 disciples had left everything, didn't they? They left their jobs, their homes, their careers, right? They left everything to follow Jesus, And they hear Jesus teaching what he's teaching. And they know that there are many people, again, that are worried. You know, today, if we're hungry, we can just go to any market, any store, right? They didn't have all that back then. Your next meal was a big deal. You better be prepared. Remember what happened with the loaves and the fishes, right? People were worried. They were worried about, again, sharing what they had, giving what they had. Jesus knew his disciples were probably thinking, wait a minute, we have left everything. What about us? And so what Jesus does this morning is he addresses the issue of worrying. Worrying. Worrying about yourself. Worrying about what you will have if you give to God. If you, again, share what you have with those around you, with those in need. Jesus is going to address the issue of worrying. And what he's going to do, he's going to give us four ways that worrying is foolish. That's what he does. I love it. Real simple. Four ways that teach us, again, that worrying is foolish. I've entitled the message, The Foolishness of Worrying. We're going to cover verse 22 to 34. Again, we're going to look at the reasons that it is foolish to worry. And the first reason that Jesus gives is that because life is more than food and fashion. Okay? Life is more than food and fashion. Let's pick it up here, verse 22. Jesus says, it says, and he said, Jesus said to his disciples. Again, this is not just the 12. These are all the disciples that are there, all the learners. Therefore, I tell you. 
Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now, one of the lessons that I've shared many times before, and you always want to remember this, the word therefore. It's important. Whenever you see the word therefore, right, take note why it's therefore. Always remember that. Real simple. It's a good lesson. The word therefore means, literally, because of what I just said. That's what it means. Now, Jesus had just told them, right, not to be greedy, not to store up treasures on earth, right? He just told them that, but to be rich towards God. He just told them that in verse 21. Now he says, therefore, because I just told you to do that, do not be anxious. Do not be worried is what he's saying. Don't be worried about being rich towards God. Don't be worrying again about giving away what God has given you. Don't allow yourself to feel anxious in your giving. Now, the word anxious, I love this, means to be torn apart. That's what the word means. Write it down. Anxious means to be torn apart. Now, I want you to imagine that picture of you being torn apart. You guys get that picture? That's what it means. And I love it. Awesome. What it means. How many times have you wanted to give something? God speaks to your heart. God prompts you to give something away that you have, but you feel torn apart. Does that make sense? You want to do it. You know you should do it. You know it's the right thing to do, but you're having a hard time. What's taking place inside you is you are feeling anxious about it. You're, again, apprehensive about it. You feel restless. There's that inner struggle taking place inside you. Now, it's one thing if you have a full wallet, right? You can give, no problem. But how about when you're down to your last few dollars? Is that hard? It's hard. We've all been there. We've all been there. It's hard. We are literally torn apart with, again, what God is prompting us to do, and we know it because we feel it on the inside, versus, again, our own flesh, our own fears, our own stresses and worries that if we do that, what about us? Well, guess what? It's right at that point, and I want you to remember this next time it happens to you, that it's right at that point that you will either give in faith or you will give in to fear. Isn't that right? I'll say it again. You will give in faith, trusting God, or you will give into fear. And all of us, I love it, it's so practical because all of us do this. Jesus understood it, which is why he tells his disciples don't allow fear to tear you apart. Don't let it happen to you. Don't let it happen to you. And again, it happens to all of us. We worry. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do this. Because then what about me? I need that for me. And it's something that we struggle with day after day after day, which is why Jesus goes on to teach the lesson. Verse 23, he says, for life, your life is more than what? It's more than food. And the body is more than clothing. We would say it this way. Life is more than about food, right? There's more to life than eating. There's more to life than Buying your next outfit. How many people, again, oh, they just love to eat, right? How many people just love to spend? It's like they work to spend to go shopping, right? This is true. We can relate to this, especially in the United States of America. And we get so preoccupied. We get so caught up. We drive ourselves in debt, and now we can't give anything away because there's nothing left. We fall into that trap. Well, Jesus reminds us, as Christians, we're only just passing through. Isn't that right? Someone say amen to that. Amen. Again, I, I, we're passing through. If this is your home, I feel sorry for you. We're only passing through. 
And because we are only passing through again, there's more to life than just eating. There's more to life than buying something new. Life is more than these things, right? We were created for so much more than these things. We're created for the next world, amen? And we need to remember that. This is what Jesus is saying. Be careful about focusing so much on physical things to the neglect of what is spiritual. The physical things are only temporary. We know that. Spiritual things are far more important because they are eternal. Well, Jesus goes on, verse 24, he says, Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They, they don't plant their own food, right? You don't, they don't buy a field somewhere and plant seed. They have neither storehouse nor barn. They don't store food in barns for themselves. And yet God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? Someone underline that word value. I love that. He's asking them. He's reminding them. He uses ravens as an example of creatures that God provides for, that God feeds Reminding his disciples, God does that. God sustains them. They don't do it. They don't plant their food. They don't store it away for the winter in barns. God provides for them on a daily basis. Now, what's awesome about this is a raven is a scavenger bird. That's what a raven is. Get this. In the Old Testament, ravens were unclean. You were to have nothing to do with them. They were literally considered worthless. You find this in Leviticus eleven fifteen, And so think about what Jesus is saying. He tells his disciples, God provides for worthless, unclean birds. And if God does it for worthless, unclean birds, don't you think he'll do it for you? Aren't you of more value to God than these unclean birds? What's the answer? Yes. We know that. Weren't we made in his image? If he provides for them, he's going to provide for us because we are valuable to God. Someone write that down. We are valuable to God. I love that. That should make you feel better, right? One of the most damaging lies that Satan created is that man came from monkeys. Because that lie teaches that we're accidents that have no more value than the animals. That's what that lie teaches, right? What a difference when you teach a child that they were made in the image of God. What a difference that makes. And this is, again, exactly what Jesus is saying. Now, what I love about this, I want you to think about this. If I ask you the question, how many of you believe that God has a purpose for your life? Would you raise your hand to that? Now, think about it. I love this. This is real simple, but I love it. I believe God has a purpose for my life. I believe he has a purpose for your life. But get this. If you believe that, then don't you think that God will provide you everything you need to accomplish that purpose? Of course. And so we don't need to worry. Amen? We don't need to worry. I can testify in my 30 years serving Jesus that God has provided for me. Okay? He doesn't always give me what I want, but he gives me what I need. Okay? And I'm sure all of us can say that. He, David said this in Psalm 37, 25. David said, I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. God, again, always provides for our needs. Second reason, let's move on. We are not to worry. It's because worrying doesn't change anything, right? Real simple. We know this. It doesn't change anything. Verse 25. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. Now, if you have the New King James Version, it reads this way. Which of you, by worrying, can add an inch to 
your stature, to your height? The answer is what? No one. Worrying won't add an hour to your life. It won't add a, a second or a minute to your life. It won't make you taller. Worrying accomplishes what? Nothing. It accomplishes nothing. It doesn't change circumstances. It doesn't make your life any better. And as a matter of fact, worrying will only make your life worse. This is true. Medically, it will shorten your life as it takes a toll on your heart and mind. Let me read something to you. Research clearly shows that stress deteriorates our immune systems. People under constant or high stress show lower T-cell counts, essential for immune response. Prolonged stress has been shown to affect the brain, making a person less able to respond to future stress, and stress is also related to sudden heart failure. It won't add to your life. It won't benefit your life one bit. In fact, again, it will only make your life worse. Well, Jesus, again, goes on to say, verse 26, if then you were not able to do as small a, a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Now I love what Jesus says. He says, wait a minute. If you by worrying can't change anything, then why worry, right? If you can't change little things, well, you certainly aren't gonna change big things by worrying, and so don't do it. You don't have to do it. What you need to do is to remind yourself that God is a good God. Doesn't God provide the sun and the rain for everyone? He does it for the flowers, right? He makes all these beautiful flowers grow. He makes our grass grow. Now, the interesting thing about flowers and grass, and I get in trouble for this all the time, I don't like buying flowers because to me they're a waste of money because they die like in a couple days. I'm telling you the truth, right? Truth will set you free. It's a waste of money to me. Why? because they're gone in a couple days, right? Rather buy something that lasts. Anyways, anyways, right? And my wife's not here right now, it's okay. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, wait a minute, I want to remind you that God provides for flowers and grass that wither and die. Well, if God does that for these temporary things, don't you think he's going to do it for you who are eternal, who are lasting? You don't need to worry. You can trust God because he's a good God. He provides all that everyone needs, even the flowers and the grass. Now, if we choose to wor worry, and we can do that, right? There are people who just love to worry. Is that God's fault? No. The problem is not with him having little power. The problem is with us having little faith. That's what Jesus said. We're the ones who will do this to ourselves If we fail to believe that he is in control, if we fail to believe that he is capable of taking care of us, if we fail to believe that he will keep his promises, we'll do it to ourselves. It won't be God's fault. We have to remember what the Bible teaches. Again, the Apostle Paul, Philippians 4.19, my God will supply how many? Every need. Not every want, but every need 
of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. God has enough, right? He is more than capable And he even promises, I'm going to take care of you. I will provide everything you need. Just trust in me. Just trust in me. Let's look at the third thing. Third thing. Third reason we are not to worry, it is foolish, is because worrying is the attitude of unbelievers. It's the attitude of unbelievers. Verse 29, do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. Don't be worried. For all the nations of the world, all the ungodly people out there, seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Underline that last phrase in your Bible. Your Father knows that you need them. We have to remember that. Don't forget that. The third reason, again, Jesus commands us not to worry is because that's what unbelievers do. They have a reason to worry, and I get it, right? I get it. They don't go to God. They don't believe in God. They don't want anything to do with God. And so they keep him out of their life, and instead, they seek after providing for themselves, When they get things, they hoard them to themselves, right? Because they live only for this world. But when they don't get things, they stress and they worry, right? That's what the unsaved world does. It makes sense for them to worry because they don't have God to turn to. But does it make sense for a believer to worry? No, Not if you know that God, your Father, knows that you need. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. God knows it. You know that God knows it. Because God knows everything. And so don't be like an unbeliever. But trust in God. What you need to do instead of worrying is verse 31. Instead, instead of being like an unbeliever who worries, you as a believer need to seek his kingdom. And what's the promise? These things will be added to you. I love that. I love that. One of the things I've always believed, and it's something I practiced in in, in my life, is that if I put God first, God will always take care of me, right? That's what the scripture teaches. Even as a pastor, since the day, again, I became a pastor, I've always believed that if I do my best to take care of God's people, that God will take care of my people. I've always believed that. And God's taking care of my family. He's always taken care of us because that's what he does. But we gotta put God first. This, this means that we have the proper priorities, seeking God's kingdom. What does that mean? It means living for God, wanting God's will to be done on earth. That's what it means, right? Wanting people to know Jesus. That's what this is about, so that God can be glorified here on earth. And God says when we do that, when we seek his will instead of ours, right? Lord, thy will be done, not my will be done. When we do that, God will honor us. And he promises to provide for what we need. Now, I love that. That means we don't have to worry, right? We just got to trust God. We just got to do what is right. And when we do, God will take care of us. And, And a psalmist, again, unnamed psalmist, wrote in Psalm 84, 11, the Lord, it's another promise, will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. I love that. That's another good promise. Just do what's right. Just live right. Honor God. And as you do, God won't withhold anything from you. He'll bless you. He will take care of you. Now, what's interesting about this is why is it sometimes that Christians struggle Again, is it God's fault? No. So what is the problem? Well, the problem happens in the life of a believer when they get their priorities mixed up. Does that happen? It happens. Yes, it happens to Christians. 
when we kind of go off track and we focus more on ourselves and less and less on God and we get caught up in the things of this world and forget about the next one. And as we do that, as a loving father, does God have to discipline us sometimes? He has to get our attention. He does this over and over and over again. Now, one of the ways that God does this, and we as parents do the same thing. When our kids go out of line, do we continue to bless them? We withhold the blessings, don't we? God does the same exact thing. I want to show it to you. Hold your place here, and let's turn to the book of Haggai, chapter 1. Haggai is the third to the last book of the Old Testament, if that helps, okay? If you can find Matthew, Malachi, again, go a couple books back. Haggai, chapter 1. I want to show you what God says to his children who had their priorities mixed up. And God had to discipline them by withholding his blessings. Haggai, H-A-G-G-A-I, chapter 1, third to the last book of the Old Testament. Look at verse 5. Haggai 1, verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts. God's talking to his people, okay? Real important. Third to the last book of the Old Testament, if you're still there, I still hear, I still hear pages. Verse 5, consider your ways. You better check your heart. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Interesting. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills and on the grain, the new wine, the oil and on what the ground brings forth on man and beast and all their labors. God withheld the blessing. He saw his own children get so caught up in their lives, in the things they wanted, building beautiful houses for themselves with with no regard to God's house. And God says, okay, I'll just withhold the blessings. Maybe that'll get your attention. Maybe then you will remember that you need to put me first. And that's exactly what God does. Again, God promises, again, that as we do what we're supposed to do, we don't have to worry like unbelievers because God will take care of us. We just got to have the right priorities, right? We got to seek first the kingdom. And as we do, God will provide everything we need because he always keeps his promises. Amen? Last one, number four, and we're done. Fourth reason why it is foolish to worry is because God always takes care of his kids, doesn't he? I love that last one. Because God always takes care of his kids. Verse 32. Fear not, don't be afraid. Little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The last reason Jesus gives us on why we should not worry and fear is because God takes pleasure in giving you everything you need. God wants to do that. He's a loving father who loves to provide for his kids. I say it all the time. God longs to be the hero in your story. That's who he is. He is a good God who loves you again. We don't have to worry. Because God wants to be there for you. He wants to give you everything that you need 
so that you'll fall in love with him even more and more and more. What did Paul say? Again, I love this verse. Romans 8, 32. Paul asks a question. He says, he who did not spare his own son, the greatest gift of all, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I mean, if he gave us his best, right? If he gave us Jesus, the greatest gift anyone could ever receive, why wouldn't he give us everything else of lesser value? He'll give, it, he'll give us everything. We don't have to worry again. It is foolish to worry. Don't fear. Don't be anxious. Know that we serve a God who longs to provide for us. And when you understand that, it frees you to be able to trust God, to share what you have with others again to give knowing that God will take care of you, which is why Jesus goes on to say, last two verses, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, Jesus is not commanding that everyone has to go sell all their stuff. That's not what he means. What he's simply teaching is if that's what's in your heart, you can do it without worry. That if God leads you again to give something, to help someone, to bless someone, to invest in missions, right? To help your neighbor, you can do that. You don't have to worry. You can do it without fear, knowing that God's going to take care of you. God sees your heart. He's going to take care of you, especially if he knows that you're doing everything with the right attitude. Now, the incredible thing when it comes to giving, and I love this and I'm almost done, is that when we give, according to last time, we are storing up treasures in heaven. Isn't that right? That's what he taught. When we store up treasures in heaven... Where is our heart? Our heart will be on our treasures that are in heaven. In other words, our heart will not be on this earth. Well, think about it. When your heart is not on this earth, is there anything to worry about? No. Which is kind of interesting because there's a lesson there. The more we give, the more we are liberated from being caught up in the things of this world. The less we're caught up in the things of this world, the less we have to worry about. So essentially, the secret to worrying less is to having our heart in heaven. Because when our heart's in heaven, again, there's no reason to worry. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we love you, Lord, and we thank you as always, Lord God, for who you are. Thank you for every lesson, for all that you share with us, Lord God. We need you. We need your wisdom. We need your heart. As always, I pray, Lord, speak to us. Challenge us. It's your word. Let your Holy Spirit do the work that needs to be done in each of us individually. That we would be directed by you and your spirit, not directed by man's opinion. Let it be you. Help us, stir us. Help us to consider our ways to make sure that we have put you number one. To be careful about being caught up in the things of this world that are all gonna go away and perish one day. Better for us if we trust in you, knowing the good God that you are, knowing you love us and you always take care of your kids. We honor you this morning, Lord. We are careful to give you the glory, the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.